mid-morning, Wednesday, September 16th, 1942, and in the middle of the vast Atlantic Ocean, there's a strange sight, probably one of the most bizarre sights you could ever see during wartime. While the rest of the world is fighting in a desperate struggle, here, in this empty patch of ocean, there's a German U-boat, probably the most feared weapon in the Nazi German arsenal, but instead of hunting allied ships, it's towing four lifeboats and flying the Red Cross flag. The submarine's captain is trying something desperate. He's attempting to save the passengers and survivors of a ship that he had sunk just a few days earlier. But then, that morning, from above, he and hundreds of beleaguered survivors can hear the droning of an aircraft, an American bomber. The German captain tries to signal for assistance, and the bomber flies away. But then, it starts to come back. What is about to happen will become one of the most controversial actions of the Second World War, because the American crew are acting under strict orders to engage and sink German submarines with extreme prejudice. As survivors wave frantically from their lifeboats, the aircraft Bombay doors open, and then all hell breaks loose. How did an American bomber come to attack a humanitarian rescue mission? Who was the brave German captain and why did he try to save the lives of those that he had just attacked? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and this is the true and tragic story of the sinking of the RMS Laconia. The story of the Laconia begins all the way back in the Roaring Twenties. The ship had just been brought into service by the Cunard Line. This company was responsible for creating some of the most famous ships in history, including Queen Mary and Lusitania, the largest and the fastest. But back then, in the 20s, Laconia wasn't designed to compete with that class of passenger liner. She was slightly smaller, more utilitarian, and just over 600 feet long. She was no lightweight though, boasting a gross tonnage of about 20,000 tonnes. She had no fewer than six steam engines, a single tall funnel, and seven decks. Despite the fact she wasn't Cunard's star ship, she was still beautifully appointed, boasting lavish dining rooms, a library, a plunge pool, and a gym, among many other luxuries that made her popular among her travelling clientele. Laconia was a unique ship. Instead of just running a regular passenger service across the Atlantic, Cunard Line decided to employ her in an entirely new and exciting capacity. Cruising. Laconia would ultimately pave the way for cruising as we know it today, at first, just offering trips between Liverpool and New York, but in 1922, she would make some serious headlines, becoming the first ever passenger liner to complete a round-the-world cruise. For the course of 130 days, Laconia, on her inaugural world voyage, stopped at 22 ports, with some 450 passengers cruising in comfort to exotic places like Havana, Panama, San Francisco, the Philippines, India, Egypt, and Europe. Many of those ports, Laconia was the largest vessel to ever anchor there. In fact, in several, she was twice the size of the largest vessel previously to have been visiting. Passengers were understandably enamoured with all the sights and the ship that brought them there. Laconia, being on the cutting edge of the increasingly popular cruising industry, helped lay the foundations for Cunard's legacy which endures even today. Fast forward 20 years though, and Laconia was in a different world. In the outbreak of the Second World War, the once grand luxury liner was drafted into service to be used as a troop ship. Liners were quite effective for wartime use, since they could successfully transport large numbers of troops over vast stretches of ocean at speed, and like hundreds of other ships just like her, Laconia was called up for service. Painted over in her drab wartime colours and fitted with eight defensive six-inch guns, Laconia went from transporting happy travellers to and from exotic destinations to carrying British troops bound for duty on the African continent and escorting convoys of merchant ships. She entered service in 1940, and her six-inch guns made her a well-defended adversary for any German surface raiders, but submarines were a different story. Back in the early days of submarine warfare, in the First World War, rules had been set that forbade the sinking of enemy passenger ships. It was a different time. 
German U-boat crews would surface their submarines and demand the enemy ship heave to and be abandoned. But then they begin to experience unexpected resistance. Some intended targets turned around and tried to ram their attackers. Even worse, the British began to deploy Q-ships, which from the outside looked like defenseless merchant ships, but in truth, they concealed hidden heavy guns that could knock out a surface to U-boat with a single shot. The German Navy learned quickly. They began to attack without warning, and the era of unrestricted submarine warfare had begun. By the Second World War, the Admiralty knew that their ships would not be approached by a surfaced German submarine. They could expect an attack out of nowhere and at any time. Laconia's silhouette was that of a passenger liner. That was unmistakable, but her deck guns transformed her into a well-armed auxiliary cruiser. She would be a legitimate target of war. Her guns would be useless against submarines. She'd have to rely on her good turn of speed to get out of trouble. On Saturday, September 12th, 1942, Laconia was steaming across the Atlantic off the coast of West Africa, completing the final leg of a six-week voyage to bring provisions and passengers back to England. On board were 463 officers and crew, approximately 80 civilians, including women and children, 286 British soldiers, 103 Polish guards, and around 1,790 Italian prisoners who were bound for war camps in rural England locked below in the ship's holds. Many of the civilian women and children aboard were family members of the British soldiers, accompanying them on their journey home. Others were nurses en route to their new postings in England. The Italian prisoners, however, would be without question the most unfortunate characters in this whole story, even before disaster had occurred. Many of the prisoners had been captured in Libya. They were told that they were being shipped off to England to work on the land. In the memoirs of one survivor, an Italian POW named Peter Lombari, he states that some of his fellow prisoners stepped onto the gangway with relief and hope in their eyes at the thought that maybe they would be headed for a fresh start. Once they were aboard Laconia, however, they endured harsh conditions locked in damp cages below deck, cut off completely from sunlight. They were offered only two slices of bread, jam and a cup of tea per day, and to bathe, they were taken above deck where guards would douse them with buckets of cold seawater. And that's if they were allowed to bathe at all. The Polish soldiers who acted as guards on board the ship were said to be merciless towards these prisoners. The de facto prison guards subjected the Italians below decks to harsh group punishment, even for the most minor of infractions, like being caught smoking in their quarters. A British officer on board, Lieutenant Colonel A.J. Baldwin, however, found the prisoners' conditions and treatment to be unacceptable. He described the bedding provided to be filthy, with dirty food containers scattered about the holds. The prisoners were crowded so close together that their hammocks couldn't stretch without touching one another, and even the air was compromised with the portholes and the lower holds having been screwed shut, so there was no air circulating among the many, many cramped bodies. The environment itself felt damp, humid, and oppressive. Aghast at the state of these living conditions, Baldwin took action to improve the prisoners' situation. The living quarters were cleaned and sanitized, they were given extended time for exercise on the upper decks, and they were offered more substantial and nutritious meals. Baldwin also made it a point to do away with the harsh collective punishments that the Italians had been suffering at the hands of their guards. Thanks to Baldwin's efforts, morale among the prisoners began to greatly improve. Meanwhile, the ship's captain, Rudolf Sharp, was keeping a close eye on a rather precarious situation of his own. He was a veteran skipper, and he descended from a long line of seafarers. His father before him had been a captain too, but this was wartime, and Sharp knew his enemy well, maybe a little too well. Two years earlier, he had been the skipper of the heavily laden Cunard Lancastria when she was attacked by a German aircraft and mortally wounded. With his ship sinking out from underneath him, Sharp had tried to coordinate an effective evacuation, but time was against him. The steamer was gone in just 20 minutes, and between four and 6,000 people had died. Sharp had survived and been put in command of Lancastria's running mate, Laconia. His mind must have turned to the path ahead of him. Some 1,162 U-boats were constructed by Nazi Germany in World War II, and Britain was ill-prepared for the unrestricted submarine warfare that would result. The Battle of the Atlantic, the longest continuous military campaign in World War II, saw these German U-boats pitted against Allied warships troop ships and merchants vying for control of transatlantic shipping routes. 
U-boats were notorious for their ability to easily cut off British shipping and supply routes throughout the Atlantic, especially in areas farther out to sea where Allied air support would be impossible. Realising the urgent need to defend against these U-boats, the British would implement technologies to protect their shipping routes and keep their much-needed supplies transported across the ocean. Quite possibly the most significant of these technology developments would be radar, in what would become truly the silver bullet for the U-boat. During this time, however, the German U-boats were reaching farther into the Atlantic than ever before, and once word had spread of Britain's new detection capabilities, the U-boats began working together in groups known as wolf packs. Travelling in these packs would drastically increase the likelihood of sinking a target even if the U-boat was sighted on radar, because now the attacks could be carefully coordinated amongst multiple U-boats. There are enough U-boats in the Atlantic during this time to allow big groups of multiple submarines to work together, targeting entire convoys of ships. Once targeted by a wolf pack, there was almost no escape. U-boats were notoriously lethal, having sunk a staggering 3,000 Allied merchant ships and warships throughout the war. They were almost impossible to spot visually. There was simply no telling when or where a U-boat or wolf pack would strike. On top of this, Laconia was travelling alone, leaving her vulnerable and open to attack. Typically, slower ships like Laconia would be escorted by destroyers or cruisers when crossing dangerous waters. The crews of these escort vessels were highly skilled in detecting and defending from enemy submarines. On this particular passage though, the navy was just simply short-handed. Most of their warships were needed desperately to support the war effort in Africa. Laconia would have to cross unprotected. This dire situation was mistaken for an act of confidence. One survivor, Lieutenant Geoffrey Greet, remembered, We assumed, if we're not going to be escorted and we can sail alone, that their log ships must think we're pretty safe. Laconia's crew were still well aware of the danger, and they took every precaution. Guards were stationed as lookouts on deck, keeping an eye out for the smooth grey hull of a U-boat appearing at the water's surface, or the telltale streak of a torpedo's wake. Captain Sharp kept the ship further offshore than he believed the U-boats would venture, and heavily restricted radio transmissions to avoid detection. And he also figured that keeping his ship on a zigzag course would prevent an enemy from tracking them or manoeuvring into a firing position. However, Laconia had one fatal flaw that would ultimately be her undoing. By this time, Laconia was over 20 years old, and while she was still a reliable ship, her boilers were desperately in need of overhaul, and they were burning low-quality fuel. Both of these factors taken together meant that the ship produced a tower of thick black smoke which billowed from her single tall funnel. It was like ringing the dinner bell for a group of sharks. No amount of clever defensive measures could make up for the fact that Laconia was now a floating smoke signal, communicating her position to any vessel close enough to spot the smoke. And that Saturday, in 1942, Laconia was not alone. Werner Hartenstein, commander of the U-156, was a decorated and adept naval officer. Having completed over 60 patrols at the helm of torpedo boats since the outbreak of the war, Hartenstein was not known to make reckless decisions. U-156 was on her fourth war patrol. These would typically last for months. The boat's previous patrol took 77 days to complete and was a roaring success. Hartenstein and his men had sunk over 50,000 tons of enemy shipping. Remarkably, the boat had successfully torpedoed and badly damaged the destroyer USS Blakely. And that ship had survived, but 60 feet of her bows had been blown off. Hartenstein was evidently a keen hunter and that Saturday he must have been frustrated. He and his crew had been at sea for the better part of a month, but had so far only sunk one enemy ship, the 5,900 ton merchant freighter, Clan McWhirter. That had been off the western approaches to Gibraltar and the Mediterranean, but after slim pickings, Hartenstein turned his attentions further south towards the African coast. U-156 was patrolling on the surface, and her men were keeping a keen eye out when there appeared on the horizon, a telltale smudge of black smoke. It could only be one thing, a ship, likely an enemy merchantman, and the hunt was on. Despite the excitement at finally spotting an enemy target though, Hartenstein and his crew would not strike yet. A daytime attack would be far too risky, leaving open the possibility of being sighted by the enemy's lookouts. They would have to wait until nightfall, stalking their prey to manoeuvre into an ideal firing position and strike under the cover of darkness. 
That evening, passengers aboard Laconia were enjoying a dance for the Royal Air Force members travelling on board. It was just after 10pm. Josephine Pratchett recalled watching her parents enjoy the dance while she and her younger brother were getting into their bunk beds and playing a game of drafts. Little five-month-old Helen Charles was in her cabin with her mother Violet and she'd been ironing her dress for the dance and was sitting down to have a cup of tea. The mood aboard was cheerful. There was a war on, of course, but for those few halcyon days at sea, the passengers could put it to the back of their minds. They were, after all, sailing aboard Cunard's Darling cruise ship, the first vessel to carry travellers on a round-the-world pleasure voyage. She was greyed out and rusted and covered in guns, but she was still a beauty. But just a few hundred metres away, while the dance went on, a predator lurked. Hartenstein had identified his target and he knew that it was a British steamer. Her silhouette was unmistakable, even in the dark. He calculated his firing solution and waited for the perfect moment. But he had made a slight mistake. In the dark, he figured this would be a 140 metre long steamer, but in reality, it was Laconia, a bigger 20,000 tonne liner. Her sinking would be a feather in any German submarine commander's cap at a time when those captains competed to sink the most amount of enemy tonnage. The biggest ship he and his men had sunk so far was only 8,000 tonnes. Laconia loomed large in his periscope. She was only 1,500 metres or 5,000 feet away at a perfect 90 degree angle, making only moderate speed, about 14 knots. His eyes keenly pinned to his target, Hartenstein whispered his orders. Torpedoes away. The Predator had pounced. <laughs> Aboard Laconia, all was well. The music played, people chatted happily, but then a deep boom sounded. big ship shook violently as the torpedoes found their target. At 10.22pm, an entry in the U-156's logbook recorded simply, Laconia torpedoed. Five-month-old Helen Charles's father, a young RAF ambulance driver from Wales, knew immediately what the sound was. He wasted no time grabbing a few necessary items and escorting his wife and baby daughter to a lifeboat station. Lieutenant Geoffrey Greet remembered having a similar reaction. He later said, I knew very well what a torpedo sounded like and I knew we would sink because, if not, the U-boat would have fired some more. I had spent three years constantly waiting on being hit and I didn't panic. I showed the soldiers how to put on life jackets and I was the last one out. Not many others were so calm and composed, however, and panic quickly began to spread on board the ship. A distress call was hurriedly tapped out. SSSS, SSSS, the standard call for help for vessels under attack from enemy submarines. It was really just a formality. There was nobody nearby to help. Laconia had no escort. She was all alone. Aboard the ship, the scene was pure chaos as the torpedoes had hit right at the waterline of the ship where the Italian prisoners were being held. Many had been killed on impact and those who survived tried to fight their ways to the upper decks in the hope of escape. The Italians' attempts to break free and board lifeboats were prevented by the Polish guards who held them back with bayonets and the watertight compartments to the prisoners' quarters below decks were closed and sealed and there could be no escape. AJ Baldwin, the British Army officer who had been in charge of the Italian prisoners and previously been working to improve their conditions, now had to enforce the rules handed down from his superiors. None of the prisoners were allowed out of the holds until British civilians, officers, soldiers and sailors had boarded the lifeboats. The prisoners, of course, fought back, straining and trying to bend the bars to the holds, and eventually overwhelming some of the guards. In a blind panic, they fought desperately to escape the makeshift prison they were trapped in as the ship's list became more and more severe. Once the prisoners broke free of their cages, all hell broke loose. People were trampled and killed in the panic, and the guards below deck fell back afraid for their own lives. Their rifles had bayonets fixed, but they had no ammunition. In the skirmishes as prisoners rushed lifeboats that were being lowered, very few were shot. They were simply bayoneted to death. 
This was a blind, furious fight for survival, and it became clear that there was little time left. Laconia began to list heavily, severely limiting the amount of lifeboats which could be practically filled and launched. Many prisoners attempted to board lifeboats, but they had their hands hacked at by ship's officers and crew who wielded axes. In the confusion and the panic, some boats were overfilled or not rigged properly, and they broke free of their chocks and plummeted to the sea below, spilling dozens of terrified passengers into the water and the darkness. People treading water below tried desperately to climb into lifeboats, but then sharks began to circle around them. Survivor Tony Large, a Royal Navy able seaman at the time, recalled, those lucky enough to find a spot in one of the lifeboats were unlikely to have space to sit as the boats were dangerously overcrowded at twice their capacity. Anyone injured trying to escape the ship was in peril of a shark attack due to blood in the water, and many of the lifeboats capsized, spilling their human cargo into the dark sea. An Italian POW, Corporal Dino Monte, later wrote that Sharks darted among us, grabbing an arm, biting a leg, but other larger beasts swallowed entire bodies. Laconia burned brightly, her fuel oil ignited. Her survivors stared on dazed as their ship, their refuge, one of the darlings of Cunard's fleet, became a twisted, scorched wreck before their very eyes. By midnight, amidst explosions, fire and panic, Laconia had finally slipped beneath the waves. Hundreds were dead, and left behind were hundreds more scared, astonished people who now bobbed alone in a very large, remote stretch of ocean. It was not a calm scene. People desperately tried to pull themselves into already overcrowded lifeboats and cried out for their friends and family members. Italians, Poles and British alike screamed and clamoured for rescue hanging on for dear life to the sides of the few lifeboats that remained, or any floating debris they could get their hands on. Writer James P. Duffy set the grim scene. Imagine this. Several torpedoes have hit a cargo ship. The vessel is ablaze, lighting the warm night sky with blistering red and orange flames that climb high into the darkness. As suddenly as the first explosion broke the quiet night, the silence resumes. With the ship gone, the fuel fires burn themselves out, the stillness is broken only by the sounds of voices. Some call for help, while others call out the names of shipmates and friends. Who has survived, and who has been lost? Geoffrey Greet, who previously expressed confidence at the safety of the ship's voyage, even without an escort, remembered that the sea was absolutely dark with dead bodies. We were looking for people who might be alive, but we had 64 in a boat designed for 32. We fixed up a rope some could hang on to, but they were not there in the morning. That was the longest night of my life. Hartenstein had watched the whole drama unfold through his observation periscope. From sinking Laconia, his tally had now risen to over 100,000 tons of enemy shipping, and this would make him one of the German Navy's most elite submarine commanders. With his hopes high, he directed his U-boat closer to the wreckage of Laconia, with the intention of taking the ship's officers and captain prisoners for information. Laconia's survivors watched from the water as the submarine slowly made its way through the minefield of smouldering debris, panicked survivors and bodies. A searchlight pierced the darkness, scoping out the aftermath of the sinking. Many survivors looked on in fear, having heard tales of German U-boat men slaughtering survivors of the ships they had sunk with machine gun fire. But as the U-boat began to sift through survivors looking for her officers and crew, they started to find terrified civilians and dozens of barely clothed Italian prisoners of war, their allies, screaming and clamouring for rescue. It must have been a terrible moment of realisation for Hartenstein and his men. Laconia had been a legitimate target of war, and yet here, scattered among the bodies, the oil and the debris, were dozens of innocent civilians. Hartenstein knew there was no hope for them. They were about 700 miles or over a thousand kilometers away from the nearest mainland. If they weren't swamped and drowned in monstrous seas, they would suffer from exposure. And as he gazed at the faces of petrified women and children, and beleaguered prisoners and men, Hartenstein realized that he was their only hope. He had been the man 
who had sunk their ship. And now he would be the man who would try to save their lives. He ordered his U-boat stopped and he ordered the crew to come on deck to prepare to take on survivors. U-156 was a hunter, but now he was about to undertake a humanitarian rescue mission. Disregarding war, creed, nationality, politics, Hartenstein and his men began plucking the injured, exhausted, and traumatized survivors from the water. The crew draped a Red Cross flag over their boat, and they distributed food, water, and first aid to the survivors. Some 200 refugees were crammed on board the tiny U-boat's decks, and the boat itself could barely fit its own 52-man crew. Lines were rigged up astern, and the four surviving lifeboats, which were badly overloaded, were rigged for towing. All up, another 200 would be kept in those boats. Hardenstein fired off an urgent message to the Befels Harbour der Unterseeboote, or BDU, which was the supreme command centre of the German Navy's U-boat arm. It said, sunk by Hartenstein, British, Laconia, unfortunately with 1,500 Italian POWs, 90 fished out of the water so far, request orders. He suggested a diplomatic neutralization of the area to effect a rescue. And Hartenstein neglected to mention the civilians, but it might have been a tactic. By focusing on the Italian prisoners who were Germany's allies, he was banking on a more likely rescue effort, and their gamble seemed to pay off. Admiral Karl Dönitz ordered seven U-boats to abandon their patrol and rush to the location, which was an incredible move because those U-boats were just about to engage in a surprise attack on enemy shipping at Cape Town. But things were about to take a sour turn because while Hartenstein and his men were taking stock of the situation and Dönitz's U-boats were en route, Hitler found out what was going on and he was furious. For his warships to abandon their posts and rush out on a humanitarian mission totally contrary to standing orders and without his approval is an affront. The rescue mission is cancelled. Dönitz is ordered to disengage all U-boats involved in the situation, including Hartenstein and the U-156. To rescue whoever they can, U-507, another U-boat, and an Italian submarine are ordered to intercept Hartenstein's boat and then the Vichy French send out warships to collect the Italian survivors too. Hartenstein decides to do something drastic. He broadcasts a distress call, not in code, but in English. He was calling out to his enemies for help. At 6am, September 13th, U-156 sent out a poignant message. If any ship will assist the shipwrecked Laconia crew, I will not attack her, providing I am not attacked by a ship or air force. I picked up 193 men. Then he gave his position. And this was actually a very dangerous gamble. Allied ships and planes could easily decide to disregard the plea for assistance and instead move on the U-boat's position where they were now open and vulnerable to attack. Hartenstein accepted the risk though, hoping that countries would come together to assure diplomatic neutralization of the area and carry out a joint rescue mission. The message was intercepted by a British station in South Africa but it was disregarded. It seemed too much like a trap, a ruse of war. Laconia had not yet even been reported missing. There was no response made. For Hartenstein, U-156 and the survivors of Laconia, now it was just the time to wait. While it was not the easiest of circumstances, Laconia's survivors and the crew of the German U-boat held an uneasy truce in the aftermath of the sinking. Hartenstein in particular was well liked by the survivors, Jeffrey Greet recalled that Hartenstein spoke very good English. He assured me that there were boats coming from Dakar. It became obvious he was a much better man than we had thought. The days following Laconia's sinking were harrowing, with Hartenstein and his crew working constantly to feed and look after the survivors. Crew members offered articles of their own clothing to the freezing cold refugees, and the cook worked around the clock to keep food and coffee available. Leaky lifeboats were repaired, injuries were tended to, and children were cared for and soothed. It was a monumental undertaking, the likes of which had never been attempted before by any German submarine crew, but nerves were beginning to fray under the pressure of caring for the hundreds of wounded and needy passengers. But then, two days later, the tides would turn. Help was finally at hand. At 11.30am, September 15th, two more U-boats and the Italian submarine, Commandante Capellini, all draped in Red Cross flags, 
arrived to assist with the rescue. The four boats together collected as many survivors as possible between them, and then a rendezvous was set up with Vichy French ships for eventual transfer of the passengers from the cramped U-boats to the more spacious vessels. They struck out slowly for the West African coast, with the lifeboats in tow. By the 15th, it had also been three days since Laconia had last been heard from, and at last, the German signals were given some credence. Two British ships, the warship HMS Corinthian and the cargo freighter Empire Haven, were dispatched to seek them out and provide aid. While the survivors were still not quite out of the woods, it looked as though rescue was not far off, and maybe things would work out alright after all. If only that was how the story ended. A mid-ocean rescue for the passengers and crew plucked from the lifeboats by friendly ships. The suffering of the Italian POWs ended at last as they boarded Vichy French ships and returned for home to loved ones and comrades. But it wasn't to be. No, there was one more cruel twist of fate still in store for the survivors of Laconia. Four days after their ship sinking at 9.30 on the 16th of September, the men and women in the lifeboats had clung together for support and morale. They'd been through horrible conditions, and in the night, the submarines, each with their own portion of survivors, had become separated, and U-156 was all alone in a vast ocean. But then, from overhead, there came a droning sound, four massive engines, an aircraft. It was a B-24 Liberator bomber, an American, and it began to circle. Hartenstein signaled to the pilot for assistance, maybe the Americans could coordinate a more effective rescue with the approaching Allied ships. This was a strange, tense situation. The U-boat men feared American and British aircraft more than anything else. A U-boat caught on the surface was a sitting duck with almost no defence. But U-156's men and skipper were confident their unmistakable Red Cross flag, coupled with the repeated radio messages and lifeboats in tow, would protect them from attack. As a symbolic gesture, Hartenstein had his U-boat's forward deck gun covered by the Red Cross flag. Up above, the B-24's pilot, Lieutenant James D. Harden, looked down at the strange scene. He wasn't being fired upon, and he could see a Red Cross flag. But how Harden and his B-24 even came to be there that day is a story typical of the fog of war and confusion. The bomber had come all the way from remote, windswept Ascension Island. Tiny, and isolated, it had a secret American base built on it in August 1942. It was almost perfectly located halfway between South America and Africa, smack dab in the middle of the South Atlantic. As a base for long-range anti-shipping and submarine aircraft, it couldn't have been more perfect, but its isolation and the secrecy of its operations came with drawbacks. For one thing, communications were scant. The base's radio station, WYUC, was not in touch with the South Americans or the British at South Africa. Its range didn't extend anywhere near that far. Instead, they relied on a British system, including a cable link to Africa and a British radio station on the island called ZBI. It was up to a British liaison officer to then pass submarine and ship sightings between the British and Americans. Now, neither WYUC, the American station, or ZBI, the British one, had picked up Laconia's distress calls on the 12th, the night she was attacked. Not only that, they never heard Hartenstein's plea for help either. But finally, days later, on the 15th, the British liaison officer handed the Americans a signal. It finally told of Laconia's sinking, but it was badly garbled. It said that Laconia had just been sunk minutes earlier. And not only that, but there was no mention of a German submarine helping in any kind of rescue effort. And to make matters worse, the base's small force of aircraft, the 1st Composite Squadron, were on high alert because two of their aircraft had already been shot at by a U-boat's anti-aircraft gun just the day prior. On the night of the 15th of September, a request came through via the British liaison officer. With rescue ships finally en route, the British requested that an American bomber from Ascension attend the scene to provide air support and keep an eye out for any enemy submarines in the area that could intercept the rescue force. The 1st Composite Squadron maintained a fleet of smaller A-20 and B-25 bombers, and none of them could make it to the location with enough fuel to spare to supervise a rescue. But as luck would have it, a single, long-range B-24 bomber had been in transit with its squadron en route to the Middle East. 
Originally from the 343rd Bombardment Squadron, the Liberator bomber had suffered a mechanical breakdown, and it and its crew were stuck on ascension. With the issues finally fixed, the bomber was quickly pressed into service. Lieutenant James Harden and his small crew would now fly their first ever combat mission. The bomber was loaded up with bombs and depth charges and sent on its way. So it was that Harden, who had no idea of any kind of rescue effort, had accidentally stumbled across the strange scene below him. He had been told to engage and sink enemy submarines that could interrupt a rescue effort, but to him, the craft below must have looked like they were the rescue effort. Attempts at communication with Morse lamps between the sub and the aircraft broke down, and Harden radioed back to base for instructions and flew off to the south. Back at Ascension, the squadron's commander, Captain Robert C. Richardson, was faced with a stark decision. Here, caught out in the open, was his sworn enemy. His instruction was clear. Provide cover for the incoming British merchant ships as they tried to rescue survivors. What if the U-boat beneath Harden's B-24 was lying in wait to attack? A group of British merchant ships caught off guard, stopped to assist survivors by a German U-boat could be destroyed in minutes with a huge loss of life blood would be on his hands. Not only that, but the U-boat might discover the secret base on Ascension. A coordinated attack on the island would be a serious strategic loss to the Allies who relied on it as a critical resupply station for forces in Egypt and Russia. Whatever decision Richardson made, he had to make it soon, because the B-24 only had limited fuel after flying so far, and minutes counted. Otherwise, Harden and his boys wouldn't be making it home. The strain must have been great, and Richardson made the call. He had no idea what the U-boat was up to. The Red Cross flag might be some kind of ploy. Friendly ships were inbound, and they had to be protected. He fired back a simple message. Sink the sub. Hartenstein, the U-boat men, and the now nervous passengers watched as the B-24 turned back around and flew low back towards them. It roared in at speed, and Hartenstein and the others must have noticed something chilling. Its bomb bay doors were wide open. In a panic, the crew and passengers tried to get the lifeboats cast off from the U-boat, struggling with the ropes and lines to get free. But above their heads, at just about 250 feet, the huge Liberator roared over and dropped two bombs from its payload three seconds apart. They slammed into the ocean with a terrific boom that sent great spouts of water high into the sky. U-156 was under attack. Hartenstein's attempts to signal peace had fallen on deaf ears, and now he had to prioritise his own men. U-156 would have to dive to get away. The lifeboats were at last separated from U-156 and began to drift apart, but the B-24 had come around for another attack run. Harden's first attack had missed, but his crew were keen to make a good show of it on their first combat mission. The bombardier lined the aircraft up for a second sweep and dropped a single bomb over the dazed U-boat. It flew through the air for a few seconds and crashed into the sea, only it didn't land on U-156, it landed amidst the panicked lifeboats. With a roar, it detonated and knocked two lifeboats clear out of the water. One survivor later wrote, we saw the bombs come down. Two lifeboats that were at the front were blown up. He'd killed at least 100 people. On board the submarine, sailors and passengers alike were tossed against the walls of the vessel by the bomb's concussion. People in lifeboats were sent airborne landing in the ocean and then frantically swimming in search of an intact boat to climb into if they'd survived at all. Dozens who had survived the Laconia sinking and then the strange days afterwards were now dead and dying in the water but the B-24 was coming around for a third pass. Hartenstein's men had sprung into action. It took time to get a U-boat ready for diving, especially since the crew had been relaxed and hardly at action stations. Now the shock of this sudden attack had worn off, and they got to work. The B-24 roared overhead again, and this time the bombing was accurate. Two straddled U-156 and detonated, shaking the submarine almost apart. One exploded directly beneath the submarine. It's a miracle it didn't sink it then and there. With a crack, water began to surge into the control room and the bow compartments. Hartenstein couldn't wait any longer. His boat was being bombed out from underneath him. He ordered his crew to put on their life jackets. U-156 would still have to submerge, even in its stricken state. 
From the damaged conning tower, he called out to any British survivors still on the deck of his submarine, they would have to get off and into the ocean. And with that, he climbed down, shut the hatch, and slowly, U-156 disappeared beneath the waves. Up above, Harden and his men in the B-24 mistook U-156's dive for a sinking, and they celebrated. They thought they had just killed a German U-boat, when in reality, they had just destroyed two lifeboats full of people. Remarkably shortly after the attack, at about 11am, when the coast was clear, Laconia survivors were surprised to see U-156 surface again. Hartenstein had dived so suddenly he still had survivors aboard his sub. He transferred them over to the lifeboats, left provisions, and then departed for good. As far as he was concerned, the rescue operation was over. Those that had miraculously survived the sinking of Laconia, and now the bombing of U-156, were left alone in a wide open ocean. Life in the boats had been tough. Survivor Helen Charles would later reflect on the situation and she said, Just imagine how my mother must have felt, a woman in her 20s with a five-month-old baby in the middle of the sea, wondering what was going to happen. Uncomfortable silence overtook the survivors, a consequence of dehydration. According to one survivor, Ron Croxton, We didn't talk a lot. Your mouth dries up. Your tongue swells. Those drifting in the lifeboats had to heavily ration their water down to as little as a tablespoon or two per day. The sun beat relentlessly on their skin, causing increasingly painful sunburn. And to add to the indignities, sharks circling in the water made toileting out the side of the boats difficult and dangerous. Some passengers that were wounded ultimately succumbed to their injuries while waiting for help in the boats, and their fellow survivors had no choice but to throw the bodies overboard ostensibly burying them at sea. To say that morale among the survivors was low would be an understatement. One of them, Jim McLaughlin, reported spending his 21st birthday crammed beside fellow passengers adrift in a lifeboat in the open sea, their clothes tattered, encrusted in salt, their lips grotesquely swollen and split. That year for his birthday, McLaughlin would receive a double ration of water. He recalled that no one sings happy birthday, no one suggests I'm a jolly good fellow, no one has the strength. Many of the abandoned survivors left hungry, adrift and thirsty, exhausted after weathering two massive disasters, simply felt they lacked the fortitude to carry on. Hours ticked by, there was nothing to do, nowhere to go, and all they could do was wait and hope that somebody would come for them. In the end, it was the German submarine force, assisted by the Italian submarine Commandante Capellini, that once again came to the aid of survivors. U-506 and U-507 sought them out and began to offer assistance to refugees, particularly women, children and the Italian prisoners of war. U-507, commanded by Haro Schacht, provided relief to survivors much in the same way as U-156 had done, with crewmen offering their own socks to freezing and damp passengers and cooking a large breakfast for all on board. All this despite the fact that U-507 had been attacked by American aircraft while loaded with survivors in the previous days as well. The German sailors reportedly doted on the children in particular, offering them chocolate and keeping them nestled on their laps for comfort and safety. After some time, the Vichy French cruiser Gloire finally arrived, and passengers at last began to be transferred from the decks of U-507 and the tiny lifeboats to the relative safety and comfort of the massive French ship. In the end, Gloire would return to Dakar with over a thousand beleaguered survivors who had spent about a week bobbing in open-top lifeboats on the ocean. But not all lifeboats had been successfully located by the vessels which came to rescue them. In the time since Laconia's sinking and U-156's bombing, the boats had drifted further and further out to sea, propelled by rough waves and currents. Most of these drifting boats were so overcrowded, most passengers had to stand on weary legs shoulder to shoulder in order to accommodate everyone. One boat was adrift for over two weeks without rescue, but finally someone spotted sticks appearing out of the horizon. They thought they were the masts of a ship arriving to rescue them, but as they drew closer they realised the sticks weren't masts, they were trees. 27 days spent drifting in a rickety lifeboat suffering from dehydration, delirium, injuries and sickness, now the end was finally in sight. Where the lifeboat had started out carrying 68 survivors, 
only 16 souls stepped out onto the sandy beach, 700 miles from Laconia's final resting place on the Liberian coast. Helen Charles, just five months old at the time of the sinking, owed her life to the tenacity of her parents who fought to save their child's life during the ordeal. As an older woman, she reflected on the Laconia disaster. She said, my family's experience can be used to illustrate something bigger than us. There is a common thread of humanity holding us all together, however bad things get. So what had happened? In the eyes of German Admiral Karl Dönitz, the most important takeaway from the incident was that German submarines could not, under any circumstances, be put in danger to rescue survivors. After all, U-156 and all those aboard her could have very easily been lost in the bombing by the American warplane. On September 17th, 1942, as a direct response to the incident, Dönitz, the Supreme Commander of the Kriegsmarine's U-boat fleet, issued what became known as the Laconia Order. The order stated that rescue attempts could not be undertaken unless there were valuable members of crew, like captains, officers, or engineers, who could offer intelligence. Civilians, if they were caught up in an incident, had to be ignored and left to their fate. To press this message home, Dönitz reminded his men of a stark truth. The Allied bombers had started attacking German cities, and the U-boat men's very homes were being flattened day and night. Three years later, after the war, the Laconia incident would come back to haunt the Allies and prove a major embarrassment. At the Nuremberg trials, Dönitz was on the stands indicted for war crimes. The Laconia order was at the centre of the case against him, and the prosecution stated that by creating this decree, he was in violation of the 1930 Second London Naval Treaty. But then, to the shock of all, Dönitz outlined the reason he'd issued the order in the first place that a German rescue mission had been attacked. Two U-boats had nearly been sunk as they attempted to save survivors with Harden's B-24 ignoring U-156's Red Cross flag, that at least a hundred survivors had been killed. The prosecution's case had backfired because nobody had even heard of an attempted rescue effort by German U-boats, and the revelation was a shock. In the end, it was found that the Allied submarine fleet had used many of the same tactics throughout the war and as a result, Dönitz would receive a comparatively lenient sentence, and he would spend 10 years in prison. But what of the American bomber crew and their commander? Harden and his men had seen U-156 slowly submerge, and they reported a confirmed kill, mistaking the controlled dive for a sinking. They were awarded the Air Medal for this, when of course, in reality, they'd only destroyed a pair of lifeboats. Robert C. Richardson, the base's commander who had ordered the attack, was never indicted for his decision. He would go on to become a brigadier general and advise on NATO planning, nuclear weapons, US defense policy, and even a space-based missile defense scheme. Richardson and his men had no doubt acted under extreme stress and with little time to make a decision, but modern assessments are not too kind on their actions. In 1993, a US Naval War College law series examined the Laconia incident and came to a scathing conclusion. It said that Richardson and Harden, the bomber's commander, were both guilty of a war crime and that the fact that no investigation was ever carried out was a serious indictment on the entire chain of military command. Well, as for the German captain, Commander Werner Hartenstein, just days after he was forced to cut away Laconia's lifeboats, U-156 received a radio message that he was to be recognised with Germany's highest military honour, the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. Not one to totally eschew humility, Hartenstein celebrated by passing around beer to his men, and declaring that he was dedicating the award to them. The Laconia order came through loud and clear, but Hartenstein ignored it. Two days after receiving his award, Hartenstein and the U-156 sank a British freighter, but again, he was reported to quickly rush to the aid of survivors, passing around provisions to those in lifeboats, and broadcasting their position to nearby shipping. But just a few months later, in their very next patrol, the end came for Hartenstein, his men, and the U-156. On March 8, 1943, she was caught on the surface by an American bomber and attacked with depth charges. Blown in half, she sank and left 11 survivors in the water, the Americans dropped rafts and radioed their position, but an attending destroyer could not find the men. They were lost and never seen again. Laconia's survivors settled back into normal life after the war. 
Survivor Jeffrey Greed remembered the captain of the U-156 fondly. Despite the terrible circumstances under which they met, he said, No U-boat captain who would sit on the surface all that time and risk his own life is a bad man. I didn't think much of him at first. After all, he had killed 2,000 of my fellow passengers. But by the end, I admired him. <laughs>